Here will be another uh, demonstration of Porter Rider Magnetic Levitation. And uh, we Professor Mark Thompson and Sophie Thompson. All right, enjoy the night. Disassembled the TV, our clock, and the stereo. That's perfectly normal. Kids take things apart. Oh. <laughs> the part that worries me is he used the components to build a ham radio set. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> is that bad? Normally I'd want to run an EEG on him, but the machine isn't working. <laughs> it's worse than I feared. What is it? I'm afraid your son has the knack. The knack? The knack. It's a rare condition characterized by an extreme intuition about all things mechanical and electrical and other social ineptitude. Life? No. It'll be an engineer.
is a coil, an ordinary coil made out of aluminum wire. Any idea why it's aluminum and not copper? Aluminum is harder to work with than copper. You can't solder to it. But why might you use copper, aluminum wire instead of copper? I know you know the answer. <laughs> Anybody else in the back? Okay, go ahead. It's lighter, but its electrical conductivity is lower than copper. But aluminum has one third of the weight of copper, but two thirds of the electrical conductivity. So for making a, a coil that you want to have lift itself, it's actually uh, it's a good scaling law. It's easier to lift a copper coil by magnetic induction than it is to lift. Uh, it's easier to lift an aluminum coil than it is to lift a copper coil. So and how are we going to do this? Well. There's a similar law in the magnetic world about, you know, like charges repel and unlike charges attract each other. Well, in the magnetic world, the north pole of a magnet will push away from the north pole. And likewise, the south pole will push away from the south pole. So if we put an electric current in this coil, we create a magnetic field. And how does the magnetic field go? Well, there's a bazillion turns of wire. The magnetic field is that way, it's like a solenoid. So in this case, there's going to be a magnetic field pointing down. If I put an AC field in, 60 hertz, I'm creating an AC current, I'm creating an AC field, and that AC field, if it hits a conductor, like this piece of aluminum, creates an eddy current in the plate that goes around, in effect, what this coil does is it creates an anti-coil underneath it to push off. So if all goes well, if I don't blow the fuse, that's for dramatic effect because I know for a fact there is no fuse in this because I took it out. <laughs> <laughs> and turn on the Variac. This provides 60 hertz current. Turn on the juice and you can see if the thing lifts off. But when you're a, a mad scientist like me, you like to go bigger, stronger, faster. So we built the Flora Rider, which both levitates and keeps itself keeps itself stable. Now you know when I levitate this thing, this coil, it floats around and it doesn't really want to stay there. Well, it's a, it's, it's, a, and it's a very under damp system. If you levitate it, it's going to sit there, it's going to bounce, it's going to fly off the edge. Well, the main idea of the floater rider is to have two coils to push off at 45 degree angles and it will self-regulate in this direction. And here's Barbie. <laughs> And Sophie Madeline, come on up. So we're going to plug in Barbie. Hey, so are you afraid of electricity? Are you afraid of magnetic fields? Doing something right. So we're going to turn on the switch. Crank up the juice. <laughs> and we just levitated Barbie. I do this demo at schools sometimes, and invariably a little boy in the audience will say, Yeah, but can you blow up Barbie? <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, this is a fairly unstable, it bounces around, and if I get it just to the right place, I can have it in a sort of a self-sustained vibration. See that right there? Barbie's getting a nice little ride. <laughs> <laughs> Any ideas how much power it takes to, to lift up something this size? It's about 500 watts. <laughs> so this does get warm. But uh, you know, Barbie doesn't seem to mind. And there she goes. <laughs> No blowing up Barbie, so I like Barbie. <laughs> now, uh, go have a seat, please. Thank you so much. <laughs> but, but the
main principle is Faraday's law of induction. If I were to put a battery on the coil and put a DC current, it's not going to lift off. Because the magnetic field will look like what's right here. And by Faraday's law of induction, which is from the tattoo right down here, <laughs> you have to have a DB, DT, a time dependent, a time changing magnetic field. So you have a time changing magnetic field, you get the flux line block that's shown here. And you see how those flux lines are sort of squished up underneath the coil? Well, that's squishing up. That's the uh, official scientific terminology, by the way. The squishing up creates a lift force in the north, northern direction. Uh, and if anybody's interested, this is all in a paper I wrote 100 years ago when I was a young man. Did I forget anything, Shelby? No, we're good to go. Thanks. Thanks, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you.
I have to wonder how bad things were in Scotland that Ireland was the land of opportunity. <laughs> in any event, in uh, 1883, my great-great-grandfather, Alexander McNeil, uh, came to the United States. His grandson, uh, John McNeil, was principal of Erasmus Hall High School in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, his wife was a teacher at that school. My mother's parents were both teachers as well. So all four of my grandparents were teachers. There was no way out of it for me. Um, <laughs> And the most influential teacher in my life was a, uh, a guy named W. David Stratton. He was um, the guy I learned analog electronics from at Dartmouth College in the early 1980s. And uh, I sort of got into this class by accident. This is the uh, lab one that I handed in in this class. And I didn't do as well as I would have liked because I went to Dartmouth to play on the golf team and to study computers. And I quit the golf team after one year, and I changed my major to physics because they didn't have computer science, they only had math, and I had to take 10 other math courses. So I didn't really think through my whole academic path very well. So those of you who are my academic advisees, sorry about that. <laughs> no, you get to learn from my mistakes, let me put it that way. Um, so I, after physics, my first two classes were great, then I took quantum physics, and I decided that wasn't for me. So I found myself sophomore year with no major. My friend said, hey, there's this class called ES64. The professor's great, you'll love this stuff. So the only problem was I hadn't taken the prerequisite for the class or the prerequisite for that prerequisite. <laughs> so I took all three of them at the same time. Um, and I did terrible. And you can see here, um, how many people have taken a class with me? Right. What's my late policy? One week. One, you can use one late for any reason at any time, uh, but after that, no exceptions. So here's tech number one. What does it say up here? Late. Yeah, you can't quite see that up there. So I always tell everyone, don't hand in the first one late. That's just what I did. So, uh, it was one of those don't do as I do, do as I say things, but um, that's the way it was. Anyway, uh, Professor Stratton, was really my, um, my model as a teacher, and still is. Um, I took, ended up taking one more class from him. Uh, really loved the analog electronics. Uh, went out and got a job in that field. Um, back in 1982, 83, when I was looking for a job, um, remember back in like 2008, 2009, they said unemployment hasn't been this high since the early 1980s. So that's when I was looking for a job. <laughs> and, uh, and it took a long time. And I found a job at a company called Analogic. Uh, I worked there for about four years. Uh, but then um, the next job I worked at uh, was not really a straight analog electronics job. It was a company called United Technologies Optical Systems, Adaptive Optics Associates. Uh, and what we did was, um, well, we we shot lasers into the atmosphere and used them as guide stars for adaptive optics. It involved optics, physics, high-speed video, high-speed digital processing, uh, very interdisciplinary, very cool, small startup company. Uh, technologically, it was very exciting. Uh, but it was also a little intense. And I always tell people, you know, when you're looking for a job, not only look for technical things, but also look for culture things. Uh, so for me, technically, when I moved there, this is some post-it notes I put up on the wall of my cubicle, because I was doing all these calculations with optics-type stuff over and over again. So here's like some noise equations I got here. Uh, here's Planck's constant, speed of light equals h nu. Uh, one electron is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs because the physics people were worried about how many electrons worth of noise there were. So this was stuff I had in my cubicle wall to reassure me that I knew what I was doing. Um, my boss saw this and had a different reaction. He put this note on my cubicle. One good amplifier equals one paycheck. Get to work, me. <laughs> and you note the, the sensitive misspelling of McNeil there as well. <laughs> So for, for that reason and many others, by the, uh, by the late 80s, I couldn't resist the call of teaching anymore. Uh, I went back to school. Uh, when I got out of school, school in 83, I couldn't stand being in college anymore. I had to get out of there. 
Uh, and then by 1989, I couldn't stand working anymore. I had to go back to school. Uh, so I went back to school. I got my PhD. Uh, and I went back to Professor Stratton and I asked him, uh, you know, everybody says I'm crazy to give up on this promising management career I had in this company. The company was growing. We were doing great. But I just wasn't happy doing it. Um, in fact, I had a dream a recurring dream where I'm driving along late at night and all of a sudden this brick wall would come up ahead of me and I'd wake up pounding the floor trying to step on the brakes. Uh, it was very bizarre. But it was one of those things where um, you know, no, no amount of money or professional success um, could have made up for the, the hunger I felt to teach, I guess, is, is the way it was. Uh, and I asked Professor Stratton about this and the best advice he gave me was uh, if, you, if you've done your research, if you've got a plan, if you have a path, don't listen to the doomsayers. There's always going to be people who say you can't do it, um, but if you believe in yourself, uh, go ahead and do it. Uh, so I did, and, and it worked out pretty well. Um, when I got my PhD, graduated in 1994, into the teeth of the worst recession between 1982 and now, uh, or 2008, whatever. Uh, and one thing they didn't tell me when I was getting a PhD is you know more and more about less and less till you know absolutely everything about nothing. And if somebody doesn't want that little delta of knowledge you have in that professor opening, you got a problem. Um, so my wife was getting out of school at the same time. She went to uh, Sloan at MIT, got a master's degree in management. So we had this map of the US and we blanketed all the places we wanted to go. And with, with little pins, you know. These were real pins, not like the Google thing. This is, you know. <laughs> um, so every time she got an offer, we'd change the color of the pin. And every time I got a rejection, we'd just take the pin out. <laughs> so things were looking pretty grim. Uh, and then, I think it was, I don't know, February or March. Is John? I don't know if it was John Orr who called me, or if it, maybe it was Kathy Emerton. He said, this is WPI, you sent us a resume. Are you still interested? I said, I can be there by 2.15. <laughs> uh, but they insisted on having me come for a whole day. Uh, and, and the interview went great. I had, I had learned uh, about WPI a little bit from working with graduates of WPI at both of my previous jobs. Um, but it was, it was a real eye-opener to see the curriculum here, the quality of the students, the quality of the faculty. Uh, it was really a fabulous place to be. Uh, so, lucky for me, uh, I got this letter from uh, WPI in 1994, started here, um, and it was really kind of coming full circle for me in a way. My, my mother's father, um, who had also been a teacher, had really also been an inspiration to me before going to college, uh, growing up. Um, I spent a lot of time with him growing up, um, and always, you know, when I was thinking I'll be a teacher like grandpa, you know. Um, and he was still alive at this time. He was like 96 years old. He was living down in Florida then. Um, and, and he had just had a small stroke. He wasn't doing very well, but, but you know, he still knew what was going on. And I went down and, and visited him and said, you know, Grandpa, I'm getting my PhD. I'm gonna be a teacher just like you. He said, I hated teaching. <laughs> my parents made me do it. The day I quit was the happiest day of my life. <laughs> Well, I don't know if it made him feel any better to know that at least I was happy as a teacher, even if he wasn't. Um, but you never know what's going to happen in life. You know, it was, it was, uh, it was quite an eye-opening moment for me. I'm glad he never let me know that while I was a kid. Um, in any event, uh, you know, I started here at WPI. Look at this fresh-faced young kid back in 1994. Back in those days, I was very frequently mistaken for a student. You know, I would, I would go get my ham and cheese at sandwich, and they would say, you know, are you going to pay for points with that on your meal plan? You know, that sort of thing. Um, but I find that doesn't happen to me so much anymore. Um, here's the sort of thing that happens to me now, and, and these are true stories. Uh, you know, I do try to work out at the gym, you know, stay in shape. I so was over at the gym the other day. And, uh, you know, I was looking for the specific weights that I wanted to use for a particular exercise. And, and some, some wispy young thing says to me, Oh, sir, the lighter ones are over there. <laughs> <laughs> I 
that's how I knew I was uh, not in 1994 anymore. Uh, and then the other day, I actually do have healthy lunches once in a while, okay? My wife insists on this, so here you see fruits, vegetables, very nice. And I was trying to finish this lunch before my office hours started, and a student came to the door, said, oh, am I interrupting, Professor? I'm sorry. I said, no, no, I'm, I'm just finishing my healthy but unsatisfying lunch. You come in now if you want. And she looked and says, you know, that's great. I'm trying to get my father to eat healthy, too. <laughs> So, um, so that was yet one more thing. So, so perhaps, I hope this has explained to you how I became a teacher, but I didn't really say anything about how I became an engineer. And I think as you saw in that Dilbert video, really, it's, it's something that's there inside you all the time. And sometimes you don't even see it uh, unless you're looking in certain ways. So I'll close with this picture of my closet at home. And if you know how I've got the shirts arranged, <laughs> Thank you very much. 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 Thank you uh, three men went to Mexico one day and uh, all got drunk. The next day they wake up in the jail and uh, the police says, you'll be executed on an electric chair. They said, what's the crime? They were not telling them the crime. And the first guy goes on an electric chair, they strap him and said, I am a priest and I believe in power of God. You will intervene on behalf of my innocence. They turn on the switch, nothing happens. Okay, God must, must like this man, let him free. The next man goes to the electric chair. He sits there, I'm a lawyer. I believe on power of justice. I, and law will intervene on my innocence. They turn on the switch, nothing happens. I guess they might like, the law might like this guy, let him go to him. The next guy comes in. Sits and said, I'm an electrical engineer. Look at those cables, we have to connect those together. <laughs> so no one will be electro ele electrocuted today. God bless his soul. <laughs> <laughs> Before we go uh, take a 15 minute break, uh, Professor Emanuel and Professor Orr have a couple of very important announcements. Good evening. This is a celebration. And we have many reasons to be in camp. Especially this evening, we celebrate the fact that 11 of our colleagues, 11 of our students, <coughs> received scholarships from IEEE Power and Energy Society. We are very, very proud of these students. We encourage you to apply for the next year group of uh, scholarships and uh, Professor Orr will recognize the students. Thank you very much Professor Emanuel. It's really appropriate that we uh, recognize these students at this uh, get-together because this department was really founded on power engineering, high voltage engineering in particular, back in 1896. And um, power systems are as important as ever, as ever, but really for the past 20 years or so, there have been very few students interested in power engineering for some reasons we won't really go into. But um, that's changing to a great extent, uh, as evidenced by the number of winners we have tonight, in particular because Professor Emanuel has been here 
and has really single-handedly kept uh, power systems engineering alive at WPI. And he really, uh, I think, is due a vote of thanks from us all for that. <laughs> Last year, the Power and Energy Society, uh, in order to help remedy the, the uh, shortage of power systems engineers nationwide, established a, uh, a scholarship fund. And I happen to serve on the committee that um, that selects the, the winners, although I don't read any of the applications from WPI students. And there were uh, 37 recipients in the Northeast uh, this year, 11 of whom are from WPI. Uh, that is a real testament to the, uh, the quality of our students and the interest in, uh, in power systems engineering. Each of the recipients uh, receives a $2,000 scholarship and uh, uh, the opportunity for a summer internship. The uh, students can be selected as early as uh, their sophomore year, can, can apply as a, as a first year student, and uh, can continue to receive the, uh, the awards. Five of the 11 winners uh, did receive the award last year, and this is, this is their second year. We're not sure that everybody can be here, but we do have a certificate for everyone. And we asked um, one of the students, um, Anthony, Anthony Congello, to say a few words kind of to represent everybody. So is Anthony here? Yes, not. Thought we'd ask him to, to be here, but we will. We, we will go on. Um, yes, uh, we'll go in alphabetical order. Ali Akhtar, are you here? Yes. James Corsini. Yes. Matthew Coughlin.
Christopher Sontag. Christopher Hill? Let's give him a round of applause. And last but not least, Patrick Sullivan. Patrick. Costa Rica? Oh. He's having a good time.